Okay, well, I'm tackling something pretty big here for this next game, and it's a system that I have wanted to learn for a long time. As you know, I love World War I as a historical period, and uh, in terms of simulation of the conflict in the period, um, Michael Resch's 1914 series is widely regarded and also extremely detailed. Um, I have finished reading the rules. Uh, I've kind of read the rules once and then flipped through a bunch of sections and read those sections multiple times. I think I kind of have a handle on how things are going and I've watched some videos as well and noticed some mistakes people have been making. So that's really helped me to understand the game. But there is a lot going on here. Um, I would say from a procedural standpoint, this is really unlike m most other games um, in terms of how you read um, your how to play well, I would say. Um, so obviously you've got things like zones of control, you've got units with attack and defense factors, as you can see, and a proficiency rating, which is very similar to OCS or Next Wars uh, combat uh, efficiency um, or unit quality. Uh, so all of that, and like terrain and movement, and all of that is pretty uh, familiar, but there's also a lot in the system, especially in the way that combat is resolved and the way the CRT functions, that is... Um, a lot different than other games that model other eras. And so it seems like the system is really trying to um, model what made World War I different, um, and specifically sort of the maneuver warfare in the early days of 1914. So this game is uh, 1914 Serbian Musturbian, and it is the Austro-Hungarian initial attacks into Serbia uh, in the opening uh, days of World War I, August 12th, I believe is the first day. So what you can see here is a board that's got a ton of stuff on it, and I will do my best to explain the strategic situation. I'm going to probably not start with rules and overviews of things the game is doing specifically, and we can get to that as we go into the video, because I think situational um, explanations where you can see what's happening will be much more useful to you than... Uh, me trying to tell you up front. Um, I will cover some of the core things though. So first of all, one of the big things about this game is unit organization. So I will use the uh, Austro-Hungarian 6th Army as an example here. So as you can see uh, over here, we have an army display card and there are three Austro-Hungarian armies. Um, there will eventually be four in the game, but there are three on the map right now. You've got the 6th Army down here, you've got the 5th Army here, and you've got the 2nd Army up north. Now, each army has different attached formations to it. So you can see here that the 15th Corps is attached to the 6th Army. And that 15th Corps is made up of several brigades and a division. This uh, first division with the orange, that is part of the 15th Corps. And then you've got the 1st, the 2nd, the 10th, the 13th, and the 8th Brigade, who are all part of the 15th Corps of the 6th Army. Okay, you following with me so far? Same is true down here. The 16th Corps is part of the 6th Army, and they are made up of the 4th, 5th, and 6th Brigade. You've also got an independent formation, which is the Sarajevo uh, Brigade. They are also part of the 6th Army. And there are a host of rules about how units activate and where they can draw supply based on what army they're in, and actually where they can move as well, what army they're in and what corps they belong to. So everyone in this 15th Corps, all these units, which correspond to units out here, uh, have to draw their supply from uh, the core train when they're drawing supply or the 6th Army uh, Depot, which is here. So that's just one example of the way unit organization um, plays a huge role in this to capture sort of the World War I organizational limits. Um, I have these markers out so I can kind of tell at a glance where the 15th Corps units are versus where the 16th Corps units are. Um, it's not so bad down here, not a lot of units, but when you get up to something like this, where you've got two armies next to each other and um, a lot of corps assigned, or a lot of units assigned to different corps and independents, especially up here in the second, um, it's going to be, I'm going to, through play, have to get used to it. But in general, units of different corps cannot join the same attacks together, and of course, units of different armies cannot join different attacks together. You'll also notice that I have separated with these sort of, I just trimmed basically the counter sprue uh, dividers uh, from the sheet to, to use as army division markers. Um, the sixth army is everything below this line, and the fifth army is everything between these two lines. And the second army is everything to the right of this. Now, technically, you're not supposed to determine that uh, until the sort of that phase in the first turn. But in order to get my head around sort of strategically what's going on, I wanted to do it in advance. Basically, the rule is units um, cannot voluntarily move outside their area of operation. So basically everything north of here, any of these six army units are not allowed to move out. 
Fifth Army, same deal, can't leave from between these two lines, and the sixth or second army has to stay east of this dividing line. Now, what's cool is that every turn you can actually change where these boundaries are and reattach units to different armies. So if I've decided I need more oomph down in the south, I can move this up, unattach some formations that might be on the south side of this marker, and actually reattach them to the sixth army as long as there is space. Um, so you can see that this army has room for three core and... Um, uh, independent formations and there is a size limit to the amount of I believe it's five and a half divisional equivalents so you're not allowed to have more than five and a half division uh, size units um, in a particular army and you can see that it's pretty easy to tell basically uh, a division size equivalent let's see if I can find a division can't find a division right now here here's a division so this is this is one divisional equivalent because it's a division. This is half a divisional equivalent because it's a brigade, which is, as you can see, one X, half a division. And then some of these units are regiments, like this one here, for example. He's not on the map, but if he was, he would be counted as a quarter size of a division. Um, so similar to OCS, you've got this concept of unit uh, size uh, denominations. Okay, that is a little bit, that's a lot to take in. Um, but I also want to talk about with the armies. So because this is World War I, uh, not a lot of room for independent thought or, uh, you know, battlefield thinking on your own. Each army starts the game with some strategic objectives. Um, the Austro-Hungarian player has specific places on the map that they have to reach or abandon um, and different things happen. So to start the game, this sixth army, this Austro-Hungarian sixth army, has strategic objectives, and I've matched the color of the cubes up here, so I have them there, to where their objectives are on the map. So they've got a primary objective, which is this town here, this town of uh, Priep Priepolie. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to pronounce the <laughs> Serbian uh, uh, names of things very well. I'm going to try. So that's their primary objective. They can take that. They are then freed from the restrictions that this objective puts on them. There's also some sort of strategic objectives here. These are all marked in white. And I think this cube is in the wrong spot. I think this cube belongs... Well, I'll take it off for now and I'll fix it. The white cubes are uh, uh, strategic objectives. Their primary objective is here. The rule is that units from this army, if they move, must move closer to one of these three objectives. They cannot deviate from that. I can't take a unit and move him away from one of these objectives to like circle around. This is World War I. Throw bodies at the problem, charge through, uh, break the enemy, and get to those places. Now, um, the Austrian, uh, Austro-Hungarian player can choose to abandon their strategic objective, which lets the army free up to do whatever they want when they move, but they do give victory points to the Serbian player. And this game is a zero-sum victory point game, meaning <clears throat> if the Serbians have points... The Austro-Hungarians have none. Like Twilight Struggle, if the Austro-Hungarians have points, the Serbians have none. And what you're tr each side is trying to end the game with 10 more points than the opponent. That is the win condition. Um, now, I should mention that the game could potentially go to 40 turns, which is quite a lot. So even though this is a one-map game, um, there's... It's a big game. It's a long game, and uh, I'm I'm wondering if maybe this video is not going to end up being multiple parts. I don't like to do that, but um, it, it may be. So we'll see how what the pace looks like as I start playing it. Um, what else do you need to know? There's a lot of other rules that uh, will come into play regarding, um, you know, uh, the way combat works and stuff like that. It's fairly novel. I will maybe run through one or two near the beginning to kind of show you, and it will also help me to understand it. Um, the other thing I should mention is that these cubes that I've placed on the map, these are sort of geographic victory points. You can see that the 5th Army, their main objective is red. They're trying to get to this uh, town city here, but they've also got this as a strategic obje or, um, operational objective, this one and this one over here. Um, or excuse me, this one, this yellow cube and this yellow cube, those are operational objectives, so the 5th the Army is kind of okay to move towards those. Um, the black cubes are geographic victory point hexes, so if the Austro-Hungarian player can take those, uh, they will get victory points. Here's another one up here, uh, and there's one down here, and I believe there's one deep over here if they can somehow do that. Um, now, the Serbians um, also have some geographic victory points that they can try and take. Uh, those I also marked with yellow cubes, but they're on the Austrian side of the river. You've got here here and here. If uh, Once per game, the Serbians, if they occupy those hexes, they can declare at the end of a turn, I'm going to score for them. And for each one they control at that moment, they will score five points. 
Um, oh, and then they can also get points if they can move adjacent to any one of these Austro-Hungarian um, hexes marked in yellow here, which seems unlikely. They don't have a lot of strength down here. The brown units are Serbian, and they're also some Montenegrin units, which you can see here. Um, and then more potentially can come into play. They're pretty small. They're probably mostly useful for defending and blocking. Um, but, you know, they are represented in the game, and you can see their, their nation down here, Montenegro. They're on the side of the Serbians. What else do I need to tell you about this game uh, up front? Well, I'm excited to play it. I have been wanting to learn this system for a long time. If I like this, I may actually try Offensiva Outrance, which is three maps and is the Western Front of World War I, um, which seems a little insane, but um, given the detail here. But uh, hopefully this will be fun. Um, so yeah, so uh, with that, let me shift over to explaining, explaining the strategic considerations for each side before we launch into it. Uh, one thing I should mention here uh, real quick is that I am actually using the version 3.0 rules of this game. So uh, the designer, Michael Resch, uh, has been sort of updating the rules for both this and um, 1914 Offensive Outrance, which is the West Front game. And he released in 2018 a 3.0 version of the rules for each game, the playbook, um, as well as 3.0 versions of the charts and terrain effects chart. Um, which you can see here. You can download them for free off of his website. I'm sure if you Google it, you can find it. Um, but he actually changed a couple of things. So um, this this is most recently updated in January 23rd of 2019. And I believe that he has said <clears throat> that the, that will be the final updates for the rule system. Um, but I'm not entirely sure what the changes were. I do know that the combat results table was changed. So it used to be... Um, I believe it used, it used to be a 2d6 system, but one of the dice had a modifier on it. And so the combat table is actually bigger. It's been changed now, I believe, to just a straight 2d6 system, as you can see here. <clears throat> um, so it's simplified it a little bit from what I understand. And I also believe this is new, the combat magnitude, although I'm not totally sure about that, where depending on the size and number of units involved in combat, there it, it modifies additional results from this. Um, so it seems like the combat results ha uh, have been streamlined a little bit. Um, and I know there were some changes to some of the other things, maybe. I, there's, it's interesting because, uh, reading this rule book, he's actually, there's sections in here that are actually, like, crossed out, um, in some of these subs, yeah, like, so you can see here, there were previous rules about certain things, specifically around railroads, it looks like, that have been just, like, eliminated from the rule book. So, um, you can download these for free. I actually got these professionally printed on, like, a thick matte paper, like what you would find in, like, a GMT game. Um, and I got the new, uh, terrain effects. Um, and combat charts printed out on cardstock, which I did at like my local staples. Um, so uh, it actually, I just basically took all the old stuff out of the box and put all of the um, 3.0, here's the playbook, right? It's got the new, um, it's got like setup, updated setup info, I guess. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Now, um, one thing to note is that um, there is a, there's some new counters that are not necessarily required for the game. They're actually markers, they're not unit counters. Um, but there are some new rules about like stragglers, <clears throat> straggler replacements, and um, some other various things that um, didn't actually have counters in the game. And so uh, GMT, I'll put it, I'll put a link in the description uh, down below the video. Um, GMT actually is going to print an updated counter sheet for both uh, the counters that come on that sheet are both for this game and Offensive Value Trance. So if you own either of those games, it might be worth it. I think it's like five dollars um, on GMT's pre order. And it just it, it adds the counters um, for the appropriate games. I believe Serbian Mysterbian has just like a handful. Um, it's some updates to the river crossing tokens uh, markers for units when they cross a river. It just changes like what the stats are. And um, there's like a couple of like one-off use indicator markers for some rules that got added in version three. You can absolutely, you do not need them, those uh, markers um, to play the game with version 3.0 rules as long as you, you know, have print out the, the updated documentation. I believe the turn track is also also updated as well um but you know you can go on gmt's website and just look at the markers and see what they are and you know if you if you really need to you could you know make your own or whatever um, i'm using stand-ins so you can see here that this is the uh drina i forget it's called like the drina resistance marker or something you can use this on the first turn of the game as the serbs to you know stop having you, you can prevent a failure of combat efficiency reduction to one unit um, and then it's gone forever. And if you don't use it on turn one, it disappears. So like, you don't even need, you know, you don't really need the token. You just need a marker for that. 
Um, and I forget, uh, yeah, and the river crossing markers, which you, you don't see right now. But <clears throat> anyways, I just wanted to point that out. Um, if you're looking to play this game, I believe the 2.0 rules that come with the game are perfectly serviceable. Um, there's just been some tweaks to some certain things in the combat systems. I think maybe just a little a little simpler or a little more streamlined in version 3.0. So uh, I thought it was worth mentioning. All right, so let's start with the strategic situation considerations for both sides here. So the Serbian army, uh, as most of their forces concentrated in the east here along the Donau River and sort of in the eastern part of Serbia, um, that is the bulk of their forces. And so at the first turn, they're going to want to try and uh, get those units to the west as quickly as possible where the Austro-Hungarians have been massing. Now, there are some considerations here. These two rivers, the Donau and the Sava, um, are tough to cross, and they give penalties to combat across and actually moving across. There's also some penalties uh, when they do that as well. Now, the both sides have the ability to build bridges over them, so one of the key things is going to be where do the Austro-Hungarians, specifically the Second Army, where are they going to try and build those bridges to cross the Sava? They've already gotten south of, of the Donau for the most part, and um, there's not a ton over here, it seems difficult um, to, or time consuming to maybe adjust their forces to come around to the right. They probably want to get across somewhere in here or potentially across the Sava in friendly territory up here and then try and come through these weak defenders. There's really a big pocket in here. So if they can, you know, if they come across here, they may be able to split the Serbian army in half, which could be interesting. Um, so that's something that um, they'll have to consider and, and when they do it. It takes a little bit of time to build the bridges, but once they do, you'll be able to, they'll be able to get across as long as they can hold that crossing. They've also got supply units they need to move up to keep all of these guys um, supplied as they cross. In the west, the 5th Army is probably going to be doing a bulk of the fighting. There's a lot of... This is sort of the soft spot because of the terrain. Once we get into these mountain areas, not as many units are allowed to attack, and also the defender gets a lot of, of shifts. Uh, but don't discount these high elevation... Uh, Matt, what are these? These are foothills um, in this part. So the Serbians, if they can get over quick enough, they might be able to uh, mount some defenses along here. There's a mechanic in the game where you can force march, which potentially degrades your units, but lets you get further. And so it's going to be interesting to see how both sides implement that ability on the first turn. The Serbians obviously want to get their infantry to the west to defend and blunt the Austro-Hungarian advance. And conversely, the Austro-Hungarians want to get across the river and they want to get through these defenders as quickly as possible and try and drive for their objective. The 5th Army specifically going for this town here. And then finally, down in the south, um, not a lot of defending units, but the terrain is extremely harsh, as you can see. A lot of these avenues of attack are going to be along these railroads and roads, um, and specifically the, the 6th Army is trying to secure sort of the Montenegrin border down here. Um, so the Serbians are going to have to figure out how much they commit up into the lowlands versus how much they commit down to these um, sort of mountain passes. Um, and the Austro-Hungarians are going to have to figure out the best way to get their supply situation sorted out so they can bring as much force to bear on some of these key junctions. Now, I'm not planning on abandoning any of the strategic plans that the 5th uh, and 6th armies have, uh, but there may come a time in the game when it is necessary to do so if the Serbians and Montenegrins uh, stall out the advance. So um, that's kind of the general overall strategic situation and consideration. Um, there's a lot that goes into the turns in this game and the combat, so I think the first couple of turns will definitely be me feeling out sort of the capabilities of each side and sort of some best practices when it comes to when to attack and where to attack. The game does prohibit you from looking at stacks, um, so not so much of a problem when you've got single uh, units that you can look at, but uh, you know when it comes time to get some of these d divisions with, uh, with uh, assets or uh, brigades with assets attached to them, I won't know specifically in most hexes who has what. Um, so it could turn into a disaster, <laughs> which it's World War I, it likely will. Um, but that's the general flow and sort of uh, strategic objectives of each side. So with all of that said, I guess let's get into it. And uh, if I think of anything else, I will uh, bring it up.